we're looking at the January 2021 Human and Social Biology paper, paper two to be specific. We're going to be doing an overview of the paper as would have been requested by many students. You could just follow. Now, just a point to note here, we are going to be doing a part of a paper and in short order, the entire paper will be published. But there is popular demand for the paper, so we sent out a part and of course the rest will come in short order. So, the 2021 January paper, here we go. Now, it reads, we should answer all questions and question 1, figure 1 and figure 2 shows two processes, A and B, occurring in the lungs during respiration. Now here we have A and I want you to take note of the air entering here and the air leaving here. I want you to take note of the position of the lungs, that type of thing. I want you to pay attention to that. And we are moving on down. Look at the diagram here. All right. So this pretty much represents the alveoli. And at a glance, it tells us that this is gaseous exchange in B. While if we were supposed to look at the diagram in A, it tells us that breathing is taking place. Here you have the inhalation of air, the exhalation of air. And you can see the lungs movement and the diagram, diaphragm there that pretty much indicates what happens during breathing. And here we have gaseous exchange surface, which is of course the alveoli in the lungs. Now let us see what's happening down here with the question. Now identify each process shown in figure one and two. So figure one, what is A? Process A. What is process A? So let's look at process A. That's the one at the top. So what do you think process A is? And this is process B. What do you think process B is? All right, I've been asked to cover the answers so that you can get them yourself. All right, so I'm going to show you, reveal the answer now. So process A is breathing. And process B is going to be gaseous exchange all right good so move on to the other question state two characteristics of the alveoli and capillary wall which makes them suitable for carrying out the process b all right so this is asking for the characteristic of a respiratory surface and they are usually moist they are usually thin they are usually one cell thick and they usually have a rich supply of blood vessel so here the first answer here we're going to have is the alveoli wall has a rich supply of blood vessel and then we gave you another to say that it is usually moist as well so if you're seeing this double line here it's just a second answer that we have given uh, you are just going to answer what is asked but we're teaching somewhat with this paper and then the capillary walls are one cell thick so of course that allows for the process of diffusion to take place readily we move on to the other question and this is looking at atp adp figure 3 shows a diagram of the atp slash adp cycle and we are looking at that there you might recall the atp being the currency of the cell or the currency for respiration there are atp storing that energy that we are going to use for respiration the question here state what happens to the energy at point a and point b in figure three you can pause we're going to reveal the answer here all right energy is added to the cycle with the introduction of a phosphate group all right so energy is added there and then at b it's only natural that the energy is perfect energy is removed from the cycle uh 
with the removal of a phosphate group so the phosphate group removing there are losing a phosphate then energy is also released all right doing well so fine moving on down to C and we want to look at this carefully figure 4 shows a graph of the oxygen uptake before during and after period of strenuous exercise you might be running you might be doing some hard work so this is pretty much what happens now you really want to look at all parts of this graph the first part here is at rest like I am at rest now and probably you are at rest now and then the strenuous activity would start somewhere here and you would have seen the graph going up so it's saying that uh, doing strenuous exercise so it starts here and it ends pretty much here then after exercise we have the recovery period which starts here and nicely ends somewhere here all right so you are seeing this arrow here a little taller than this but pretty much what we have to work with what we have all right and here we create the oxygen deficit and here is a post exercise oxygen uptake oxygen debt being repaid within this area the area right under here that is all right so the graph they're showing make sure that you're reading everything on the paper figure four graph of oxygen uptake before during and after strenuous exercise so the first question that comes up for this diagram is uh, use a graph in figure four to determine the time in minutes at which the oxygen deficit begin all right so the oxygen deficit let's just go back to the diagram and see when the oxygen deficit begin so this is pretty much the area this area right in here is where the oxygen deficit is so you realize that all this area up to two minutes we were at rest but then the oxygen deficit started here at two minutes and it continued onward all right onward during the strenuous exercise up to about nine there all right so it begin all right begun at two minutes is that your answer all right cool that's what we have there and then there's something else that we're supposed to look at but just before we look at that let me just point this out let me point this out these red lines this line and this vertical line this orange line here and this vertical line I drew them these are not pretty much a part of the exam I drew them in order to show you how it is expected that you will answer questions using graph uh, so I put that in there and let us look here explain why an oxygen deficit would have developed at the beginning of a strenuous exercise or the beginning of strenuous exercise all right you can answer pause we will reveal aerobic respiration responds slowly to the rapid demand of energy using up oxygen in the body to supply the energy needed this is preceded of course by anaerobic respiration altogether the process creates a depth so pretty much when we started out we pretty much started out with anaerobic respiration because we didn't have the amount of oxygen to get that energy going so that is why we have a debt at the start there of the strenuous exercise and then state one way in which a body would have coped with the deficit in oxygen now you can pause there I'm going to reveal our answer it respired anaerobically during that time that's how it was able to cope use a graph I use a graph in figure four to determine the time in minutes at which the oxygen debt is repaid so the time in minutes we want to find out the time in minutes that the oxygen debt was repaid all right so let's let, let us go back to the graph and look at why I drew these lines so pretty much I wanted to read the graph but first let's look at this here now this slash here means that some of the data is missing some of the data here is missing you could use this or you could use something that looks if you pay attention to the screen that looks pretty much like it goes that way it goes up that way come down go back up that way and go like that pretty much like a, something like a lightning flash or something like that we could use that symbol as well so some of the data is missing here 
so we drew this line across and it is showing the rest position right across and what we have here is the recovery period so you're realizing here that uh, the uptake of oxygen is reducing right so we're panting panting and it's getting slow and slow but the curve continues through this uh, missing data line and comes right out here to somewhat level up so we're saying that the, it intercepts nicely here with this vertical line just where it started leveling up right here the, it intercepts with the vertical line so we're saying that 30 here but we're talking about the recovery period so the recovery period would have started from 9 to 30 so then it's only natural that we're going to subtract 9 from 30 and that should give us the answer let us look at that in minutes to see what we have there so in minutes 30 minus 9 so it took about 21 minutes to recover uh, we're going to explain that because first might be wondering hey the exercise was so short so why so long the recovery period uh, and sports day you would have had that experience or you would have seen someone suffering uh, or someone undergoing that to repeal, fill on the field and all of that. Alright, explain why the oxygen debt needs to be repaid during the recovery period. So this question is going to nicely explain why 21 minutes, right, and not a shorter period. Not, why not 9 minutes? It's so long, 21 minutes. Alright, so let us look at why a number of things happened and some we didn't hear we were not even aware of. Alright, so one of the reasons is that to remove lactic acid from the muscles that would otherwise damage the muscle that is very important to know so we have to repeat that oxygen to ensure that that happens now energy was also borrowed and the oxygen obtained by heavy breathing after activity compensated for that now respiration also had increased Hence, the excess carbon dioxide must be removed during the oxygen depth repay. So we are repaying the oxygen. We, that's, that's another reason. Now, another thing is that temperature also increased while we were going through that strenuous activity. Uh, repaying the debt also helped in cooling the body. One might ask, how? Now you are exhaling and while you are exhaling you can attest to the fact that you are losing some amount of heat as you uh, breathe out, right? And then you would understand sweating and all of that taking place. So this is the reason we have for that particular question. Let's move on. So that's our first 15 marks. Question number one. We are now at question number two. Now question number two, figure five shows a diagram of the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system is that second second circulatory system pretty much moving waste uh, uh, around the body it's usually unidirectional one directional and it has some valves to prevent backflow so we're looking at the diagram here we have the spleen and it wants us to look at what does a represent and a showing these little uh, nodes or that type of thing and we're seeing some straight lines here so we think that b is showing Ducks. Let us see what we should identify. Identify the structure labeled A and B. Alright, so you can quickly do that. Pause the video. We're going to reveal. Alright, here we go. So A is actually the lymph nodes and B is of course going to be the lymph duct. Alright, so two marks there. Now state one function of the spleen. You would have seen the spleen being one of those organs of the lymphatic system. Function of the spleen. Reveal. The spleen fights or guard against invading pathogen. That's one. And we gave you a second. Filters the blood and remove any unwanted red blood cell. Alright, so we gave you two, but it actually asks for one. In your exam, please just give one. Alright? Moving on down, uh, figure 6 shows blood flowing from the artery to the vein and capillary bed. So this is pretty much a capillary bed. Alright, let me just talk a little bit about this before we move on. Now, the capillary bed uh, pretty much shows tissue 
been bought in what we call tissue fluid. Now, what is tissue fluid? Tissue fluid is actually plasma with the good stuff that the body need, the oxygen, the nutrient that the body with the cells would need. Uh, that would have squeezed out of the blood vessel here. So you're seeing the blood coming here, and it has been squeezed out through the walls here. And of course, it forms that layer between the blood vessel and the cells are the tissue themselves so this is just a liquid that that pretty much bought the cell all right now while it is squeezing or what really causes this to happen is that as the artery moves to the vein the artery branch into some smaller vessels called arterioles and then capillary that type of thing and as that happens you understand that the pressure increases so we have some more some amount of ultra filtration taking place now there's a pressure on the inside and there's also pressure on the outside of a blood vessel that regulates pretty much the substance coming in and going out so it keeps that uh even so so to speak movement just to ensure that the right amount is moving in both direction now while the tissue fluid would have brought these useful substances to the cell now the tissue fluid is also removing unwanted stuff and of course that is re-entering the blood vessel you are seeing it at the arrow here so it's re-entering the blood vessel here and pretty much leaving via the vein however there is always some amount of tissue fluid that remains even after tissue fluid would have re-entered the blood with the waste and it's leaving via the vein now the remaining tissue fluid that is left here it enters this area here called a lymph capillary now the lymph capillary as soon as this remaining tissue fluid gets into the lymph cap capillary it is called lymph and of course one direction it's going to go somewhere up to your collar collarbone region there and it's going to rejoin the blood to be excreted now a lot said about the lymphatic system and the capillary bed there let's look at the question with aid of a figure of figure six describe how tissue fluid and lymph are formed so i just told you a little bit the tissue fluid it's so let's let's just reveal this it might be a little wordy uh, of course it could be we could use less words but just for the information all right so tissue fluid is formed from ultra filtration uh the liquid plasma of course without plasma protein squeezes out of the arteriole to of course bath the cells now the size of the artery reduced to arterioles then capillaries this causes the hydrostatic pressure which forces the liquid plasma out of the blood now this is uh, there is also hydrostatic pressure of the tissue fluid on the outside and of course a difference in water potential now this helps to regulate the flow or the formation of tissue fluid now some of the tissue fluid will return to the blood of course with the waste however some will remain between tissue and the blood vessel now the remaining portion will of course enter the lymph capillary and there it is called lymph hence lymph is made from the remains of tissue fluid that actually entered the lymphatic capillary or the lymphatic system pretty much that's the answer there a uh, person might argue it a little different it can be less wordy but that pretty much gives you good coverage of that question well let's see now this is what we were not expecting but it is here and here again for the umpteen time we have a current problem on the exam paper coronavirus you can see it here now in influenza season has begun and as a result of the corona epidemic ravi decides to take a course of antibiotic to prevent him from contracting the coronavirus to further protect himself ravi decides to become vaccinated against the coronavirus now question explain to ravi why taking antibiotics is not a wise course of action all right so 
Think about it, pause the video, and you can answer. I'm going to reveal. Now, antibiotics are medication made to safeguard us against bacteria. Bacteria are not virus. Influenza and corona are both viruses. Hence, the antibiotic taken for this reason will be more harmful to Ravi later. He could develop antibiotic resistance and find it difficult, if any at all, to respond positively to an antibiotic if he should be treated for a bacterial infection later. Alright? It could be said other ways, but that's my way. And if you use the antibiotic when it's not needed, of course you put, you're putting yourself in a position that it might not work when you actually need it because of antibiotic resistance. Other question. Name the specific type of immunity that Ravi would have developed after his vaccination against the coronavirus. The coronavirus, a pretty new technology being used to treat the coronavirus. I think it's called the mRNA, memory RNA. Uh, something that has been worked on for quite some time but got some more funding now and as such it came out on the market pretty pretty uh, early so let's reveal and see what the answer is going to be here so it is going to be artificial because it's actually man-made active because it is going to cause the body to create these antibodies and acquired because it's coming from somewhere else uh, so it is actually artificial active acquired immunity all right so we move on to the other question after receiving the vaccine ravi falls ill a few days later explain why ravi becomes ill in spite of uh being vaccinated so some person might call it the inflammatory response or the information response some might call it the immune response uh Pretty much they are almost the same there, uh, looking at how the body behaves when there is a, a foreign invader. So let us look at what's here. You could pause the video and I'll say again as we reveal. Alright, so the immune system or the immune response, the immune response, uh, that's what we're looking at here. Once a foreign matter enters the body like the vaccine. The immune system is activated to protect the body. Blood vessels dilate. Blood flow increases. Temperature is increased to kill the pathogen, which causes the in individual to feel sick while the body builds immunity and memory for the pathogen. It is a normal part of acquiring this type of immunity. So don't worry yourself too much if you were supposed to get the vaccine and feel sick. It's a common part of gaining this type of immunity with a vaccine. All right. So Ravi Friends, Rashi, Arushi, has just returned from a region in which several individuals are infected with the coronavirus. Despite being exposed to the virus, Rishi did not contract the viral infection and thus did not develop symptoms of the disease. Explain why Rishi did not develop any symptoms though he had been exposed to the virus. What do you think? You can pause. We're going to reveal. So this is our answer. Now, Rishi could have been immune to the COVID virus. That's the first possibility. However, by washing his hands frequently with soap and water, using sanitizer after touching surfaces, uh, ensure areas visited was is sanitized. He avoided touching his face, kept his safe distance, he maintained a health immune system and of course he wore a mask as you're asked to do so these could be the reason 
why he was not infected. A long list of stuff there uh, that probably you could write less, but a whole lot said there that, of course, could garner that three marks for this question. Fifteen marks as the end of our second question. We move to our third question, which looks at cells. Now, define the term cell differentiation. So it could be in your notes as cell differentiation or cell specialization. All right, we're going to repeal. You can pause. Good. So cell differentiation refers to the cell becoming specialized to carry out a particular or a specific function. You could talk about the nerve cells being specialized. You could talk about the red blood cell, the different types of white blood cell, the sperm cell, and the list go on and on. All right, so we're looking here at figure 7 and figure 8 and they show photographs of two types of cell A and B the cells are here I'm not too sure how clear they are for us to figure it out we have cell A and we have cell B now identify each type of cell shown in figure 7 and figure 8 and state its function it's very important that we can figure this out because if you don't you're going to be losing even some marks that has nothing to do with the name of the cell all right one might say all right so let's reveal all right so a is a muscle cell we're thinking it's a muscle cell and the function of the muscle cell is to of course contract and relax to cause movement you can tell us what you think in the comment below all right then B, I'm going to reveal, B is going to be our epithelial cell, all right? And they form a protective covering for organs. So it's pretty much a one might epithelial, epidermal, that type of thing, cell. And of course, a function there is to form this protective covering for our organs. And then we move on down complete the table below by naming the correct cell structure for each scenario the first row has been completed for you so you would have seen the first row there bindi suffering from extreme fatigue due to the failure of his cell to produce atp which cell organelle is most likely affected uh, energy ATP, it's going to be the mitochondria every day of the week. Now, Dr. Wang has observed that his host plant is wilted. Which cell organelle is most likely impacted? Now, a lot of persons uh, have the challenge. Is it the vacuole? Is it the cytoplasm? So, our answer here is going to be the vacuole which has that water reserve that helps the cells to be turgid all right and then we have aaron uh hopes to remove carbon dioxide from the air by stimulating the growth of plants which cell organelle would be important in reducing carbon dioxide level in the air now once we talk about carbon dioxide we're going to be talking and talk about plants we're going to be thinking about photosynthesis and if you think about photosynthesis and plant then you can just think quickly about chloroplast so the answer there for us is going to be vacuole and chloroplast the motor neuron in an arm have lost their myelin sheet explain how this loss will affect the movement of the arm interesting here Pause, think about your answer, then you can check ours. We're going to reveal. Now, the myelin sheet insulates the neuron, causing impulses to move rapidly across nodes. The nodes increase the rate of impulse transmission. Therefore, if they become damaged, the impulse will move slower, which retards the reaction time of the arm to a stimulus so it will definitely slow down the movement of the arm as the myelin sheet plays a very important role with the
passage of the signals. We move on down to this question. Five-year-old Anna thinks that the sunflower pinwheel shows in figure nine are alive. She says they move and uh, when they get tired, they stop moving. I have so many pinwheels, they must have babies. All right, so I want to explain to Anna why this is not so. Now, you might have visited our channel, uh, CSEC Biology, the cover page, and you would have seen our characteristic of living things video. It's a video that is doing really, really well on the channel, and that video would nicely help you to answer the question here. So, by referring any four characteristic of life explain to Anna why a sunflower pinwheel is not alive all right so we're looking at characteristic of living things or one might say characteristic of life so you could pause we're going to reveal so the first thing we want to look at is that the sunflower pinwheel cannot grow all right which is and growth of course is a permanent increase in size and complexity complexity of an organism so if a sunflower can't grow that's one good reason to say that it is not alive another thing is that the pinwheel does not carry out respiration all right which is the process by which energy is released from the food we obtain all right are the food now it does not carry out excretion that's another very important thing which is the removal of metabolic waste from the organism so there we have three going another thing is that the pinwheel does not reproduce this is the production of offspring by either sexual as asexual means and that doesn't happen with a pinwheel all right finally to be alive the sunflower must have all characteristic of living things and it doesn't have any here while Anna would have said that it when it is spinning of course it is using some external force not pretty much anything that comes from the pinwheel itself right and as it were as for tired as soon as the energy is not provided from that external source it will always stop now it is not reproducing uh, we have a lot of toys sometimes we really don't keep track of this toy but these are some salient point we could share with Anna as to why the sunflower is not alive and that finish or that takes us to the end of a three question that we would have promised uh, then that, that is going to be part one for this 2021 paper we will definitely I uh, publish the other people so you want to like share subscribe share to as many persons and leave us some comment below the video here and of course look for the playlist for the other past papers that we have on the channel all right so here we have question number four we could give you a peek of what is happening with question number four you are supposed to name the causative agent of AIDS here uh, we're just going to show you the causative agent is of course going to be a virus not bacteria not fungi it's a virus and the name of the virus is going to be the human immunodeficiency virus we call it hiv so here we have another question and of course we will be completing this for you the next time we see you so we leave you with this question here all right take care